there's something just really good about seeing people greet each other, talk and smile and uh, just enjoy one another's company. So <clears throat> thank you for having me again this morning. Um, I'm about to do something that's sort of out of my comfort zone. Um, I had prepared a message for this morning, and um, I don't think it was the message that, that God prepared for this morning. And so he's been putting this verse on my heart all morning before, actually in the first service, um, I was kind of trying to not pay attention to it. And then when it really came upon me, I felt myself actually shaking uh, in my boots, literally, as I stood before the first service. But So if you have notes in your bulletin, forget them. Uh, <clears throat> but I would, would like to continue, in a sense, our theme of uh, being schooled in the wilderness. Um, and it comes from Hebrews uh, chapter 3. And I wonder if you just turn there, I want you to to understand that this theme runs all throughout Scripture. Really, the passage or the intent of the author of the book of Hebrews is to communicate to a people who are discouraged, and he uses the illustration of the children of Israel in the wilderness to encourage them. Uh, the Hebrews, as the name would suggest, were Jewish followers of Christ. They had seen the lack of power in Judaism and had given their hearts to the Messiah, Jesus. And like many of you know, while it initially brought great joy and power to their life as it has to all of us, it didn't mean that life would not be difficult and that in a sense the road that God would call us down would be a road less traveled, a road that we would not necessarily choose because who in their right mind would choose persecution, who would choose animosity, who would choose maybe the loss of job or family members, and in the world of early Christendom, persecution was something that we in the United States know very little of. And so the writer of Hebrews says to these Jewish believers, I know it's difficult, but you don't want to go back. Remember why you came to Christ in the first place. Remember, Jesus is the final word, chapter 1. And Jesus is touchable. He's the brother. He's the captain. He's the king in chapter 2. And Jesus is better than Moses in chapter 3 and better than Joshua in chapter 4. Jesus is better than the angels. We see Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, so let us run the race that is set before us, he says in chapter 12 of Hebrews. That race ordained for each and every one of us to ultimately finish together. But there's something that he says to them. I know you want to go back, but don't forget that Moses couldn't bring and Moses, that father, so to speak, the one that God gave the ordinances in the temple and much of Judaism too initially to give a description to the people, Moses couldn't bring you into the promised land. He couldn't bring you into that place of rest. And Joshua brought you into that promised land, but he couldn't provide rest either. But we see Jesus and so one of the things that is so important when we're finding ourselves in the midst of that turmoil or anxiety or discomfort or wilderness training is where do we look finding 
rest. So in Hebrews chapter 3, 3 and 4 really, there's a word, two words really, that we hear over and over again. Chapter 3, verse 7. It says, So as the Holy Spirit says, today, certainly applicable today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and 40 years saw what I did. We remember last week, Moses says, remember what the Lord thy God has done for you, how he led you in the wilderness to test you, to humble you, to find out what was in your heart. Your shoes didn't wear out. Your sandals didn't wear out. You didn't lack for food. God prepared along the way. Remember. And he says here, where your fathers tested, tried me. And then he says in verse 10, and that is why I was angry with that generation and said, their hearts are always going astray. And they have not known my ways, the ways of education in the wilderness. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And so they wandered all those years. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all whose, those Moses led out of Egypt and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Now it goes over to chapter 4 and continues eight or nine times to talk about the fact that they didn't experience rest. They lived in anxiety. They lived allowing the discouragement and the disappointment and the unknown future to dictate their present comfort level. And as he communicates again over and over, he says, today, five times, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Would you pray with me? Father, I'd ask that you would speak. Not because I'm so in tune with you or because I'm eloquent, but that you, as only you can, so uniquely, so wonderfully, so personally, speak to each person here so differently because you know each heart here. You know what they need. And God, it's always amazing that one message says so many different things to so many different people. But the one thing we have in common, God, is on this side of heaven, wilderness is our experience. And the other thing we have in common, God, is today. And so, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if we'll hear your voice, don't let our hearts be hard through the deceitfulness of sin. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. The passage really struck me because one of the things that I think is so important as people is that we recognize every change, every transition has an ultimate goal in mind, God's goal, which is transformation. And that transformation comes as a result of our hearts not becoming hard. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 3 says something interesting. He said, I was the only child in my mother's house, still tender. 
So that my father said unto me, if you keep my commandments, you will live. The word tender there is sometimes translated teachable. People who are lifelong learners, if you will. People who want to hear from God and there's no better day to learn than today. For all we have is today. The past is gone forever. The future is unknown. But today, the Holy Spirit, Scripture says, would speak to us. And a part of its reasoning and purpose for speaking to us is so that our hearts would stay pliable. Our hearts would stay tender. Our hearts would be vessels, if you will, like the pot and the potter in Jeremiah 18, where God shapes us into a vessel that he can use, a vessel that would fulfill his purposes, a vessel that would live according to his meaning in our lives today. I oftentimes think of how important it is for our hearts to say tender. In our culture, in our world, as, as men especially, it's not so easy to stay tender. Uh, type A, aggressive males like myself, who take pride in being hard, fill in the blank, it's, it's, it's easy to sort of be that macho kind of person. I don't want to be that kind of person. I found myself sort of growing up in a world where being tough was where one would find their value. So you play tough, you work tough, you act tough. As a kid in the neighborhood at the park, the older guys would pick on you to see what it would take to get you to cry, and so you would stifle that tenderness. And yet it was that very tenderness that makes us, in a way, able to be transformed. I, I think of my son, my youngest son. He was... He, as a little guy, was just so tender. I mean, if you wanted to go into, the, uh, into a place through the exit instead of the entrance, he just wouldn't do it. He was, he, his heart wouldn't let him do it. He, he wanted to make sure he was always doing the right thing. When his goldfish died, and some of you probably have kids, and the goldfish dies, you think, you know, it was the end of the world. You know, we're saying, ah, just flush them down the toilet. And they're, they're in tears because their heart's so tender. They try to be tough. They put their upper lip, you know. But you can see the tears coming out of their eyes. And you love that about them. You love that tenderness. Because it's the ability to stay in awe. And maybe that's why Jesus said, don't keep the kids from coming to me. There's something about them. They're believing. They're forgiving. They're, they're filled with awe and wonder. And if you step back and look, you see as they get older, there's a certain level of tenderness they lose. I remember when my son got a little bit older, he was about eight or nine, and we were living in the country, and we got BB guns. And, he, and we were going to go hunting. And in Virginia, where we lived, there were these big black snakes. They were harmless. They, were, they killed rodents, but man, they were big. I mean, and when you saw them, they sometimes would hang in trees or they'd hang around the shutter or you'd go in the barn and they'd be there and they'd freak you out. But I said, hey, let's go, let's go hunting for snakes. And yeah, and he's, you know, 80. Yeah, let's go, Dad, let's go hunting for snakes. And so we're walking down the road and uh, all of a sudden one comes out and it sort of looks at us and I go, watch this, Jesse. Picked it, bang. I wouldn't have hit that snake in a million years, but I hit it at that moment. And all the blood in its neck started squirreling out. And he looked at me and he looked at the snake and he started bawling and he, and he ran into the house. I'm going to tell mom on you. Because <laughs> his heart was so tender. And you never want to see your kids lose that. And as our Father in heaven looks upon us, he never wants us to lose that tenderness. That's why maybe there's so much in the scripture about a broken heart and God drawing nigh. It's that teachableness, it's that tenderness that keeps us leaning into God, pressing into God. Because I said last week, it's not just about pressing into God, but it's about pressing into each other to keep our hearts tender. And yet, in the wilderness... When we're going through difficult times, 
Scripture says, guard your heart. Because the deceitfulness of sin wants to enter in and take it away. Take away that tender heart. Make you hard. What does that, what does that mean? Well, all throughout the wilderness, sin provides us with solutions that are short-lived. Augustine called them disordered loves of the heart. He said whenever we make good things the ultimate thing, our love is disordered and we'll become angry because those things will never deliver. They might give us immediate satisfaction. And in many ways, we do that in our culture. That immediate satisfaction can come by a spouse. It can come through a job. It can come through an education. It can come through a car. It can come through a pastor. It can come through a church. While all of those things are good things, we should love those things. But if those things become the ultimate thing, they become a disordered thing, and it ultimately hardens our heart because it can't deliver. They become idols of the heart, and idols can never deliver. And the deceitfulness of sin is what disordered love is all about. It's deceitful because it overpromises and underdelivers. It looks good. Don't let anybody fool you. Sin is sexy. Sin is uh, appetizing. Sin is is good looking. Sin is sin is everything that sin professes to be. It provides that immediate gratification that leaves a sour taste in your mouth. And that's what people do in the wilderness. They look for quick fixes. They look for people to blame. They, they, they look for other, other places to go. Maybe other churches. Maybe other um, schools. Maybe whatever. But it's the deceitfulness of sin that professes to give and provide something that it can never provide. And so these Hebrew believers as it was true of the children of Israel, as it's true of our life each and every day, have to guard ourselves against the deceitfulness of sin. From the very beginning, one of the things the wilderness teaches us is not just about God's supply, but it teaches us about our hearts. And sometimes I don't like what I see. It takes me to places where I recognize that I don't really believe. And in my lack of belief, I never enter into rest. I never enter into really trusting God. I never really see him in the adventure of the newness of the unknown. And so my anxiety level causes me to want to medicate myself in a way that I don't have to deal with it. And God knows this world provides all kinds of ways to medicate none of which ever provide rest. The nature of addiction only causes us to want more and more and more. And that's the deceitfulness of sin. It's like the serpent coming into the garden and saying, you know what? You can be just like God without God. And they bought it. Because they felt that in the midst of it all, God was holding out. Because there's always something in us that says there's something better out there. Uh, But tender hearts are what God is calling us to. And hearts that are passing through the wilderness are hearts that God is interested in. God is interested in us. And he wants our life, not just to experience transition, but he wants our life to experience transformation. Because as the scripture says, we with open face behold the glory of the Lord in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are changed even by that glory and through that spirit. And so the writer of Hebrews says it over and over again. He says, today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice. Because every single one of us is looking to find that place of rest. That's what the whole book is about. And so when we see the children of Israel in the wilderness, they're filled with anxiety because they don't know the future. We don't know the future. But the past 
reminds us that we know the God who supplies and therefore we know the God who holds the future in his hand. And if we can trust him for our salvation, can we trust him for our transformation? You see, the Hebrews wanted to go back to Judaism. Just like the children of Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. And in the process of not experiencing satisfaction on any front, the natural thing is to blame somebody, right? I mean, remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Adam says, hey, God, the woman you gave me, she made me do it, right? And Eve said, hey, the serpent, he made me do it. Instead of allowing God to work in their hearts, we become very defensive, self-protective, because we don't like what we see about ourselves. And yet what the writer of Hebrews is saying, again, let me read it, today, encourage one another. Don't let your hearts be hardened, but encourage one another. He says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. So what's today called? Today. And when we get to tomorrow, what will that be called? Yeah. And then next week when we get there, what will it be? Today, because that's all we have is today. And we're the most like God when we are communicating his grace to each other, his compassion to each other. Because there's something about grace and compassion that tenderizes hearts. There's something about people loving on us that makes us more susceptible and tender. I went to the movies last night. I went to see Heaven is for Real. A little cheesy, but I like cheesy. But I found myself weeping through half the movie. Somebody was sitting next to me. They go, what is the matter with that guy? But I love it when, when my heart gets tenderized. Because my natural inclination, look, I, I work hard. I, I play basketball three times a week hard. And some say dirty. I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I'm just type A and that's my life. And I love it when God brings tears to my eyes. I love it when my heart is tenderized. But I know this, that the world wants to make me hard. The world wants to make me judgmental. The word, world wants to make me critical. The world wants me to play the blame game and live out the reality of discovering God and me and what that means as he loves me to love the world around me. So I saw that movie, and how many of you have seen Heaven is for Real? For real? It, it is just a, so supposedly based on a true story, and uh, pretty freaky if it is when you think about it. And yet, interesting how a church who probably heard message of heaven for such a long time, really struggled with the fact that this little boy described it in ways that didn't fit into their box. But you couldn't help but sort of his innocence, his tenderness, his beauty. And I thought, God, make me like that. Make my heart tender. Make me an encourager. When I think of you and I, are recipients of God's grace, right, and compassion. And it, in some ways, I trust for each and every one of us when we came to faith, there was something that happened in our heart that began that process of breaking. And it is through the breaking of our hearts that we begin to be pliable. Because my, uh, let me suggest to you that God isn't as concerned with your sin as he is concerned with your hardening. 
It is the hardening of our hearts that keeps us from being pliable. And it is the hardening of our hearts that comes as a result of trying to find something else other than Jesus to provide us with the means of supply, the means of satisfaction, the means for a future. Jesus, Hebrews said over and over again, but we see Jesus. And I think one of the ways that we can really honor Mike is see Jesus, the centerpiece, the one who walks down the aisle, he said it, right? And trust that as God has his plan and his purposes, our job is to see Jesus and to allow him to tenderize our hearts so that he can shape us into whatever he wants us to be, whatever that is. It ultimately looks like him in whatever capacity he calls us to. And so the scripture says, so encourage one another. So love each other. And know, and know what the result is here? And find rest for your soul. Isn't it hard trying to be God? I mean, it's exhausting trying my plans and my strategies and my gimmicks and you know I'm more like Jacob than I like to think I'm wheeling and dealing all the time I have to guard against it I'm a street kid I want God to have his way in me I want God to have his way in you because you and I both know only when we find our way in him at we at rest. Other than that, we're spinning and planning and scheming and because that's what we discover in the wilderness. We look at this story in the wilderness and we say, oh, that's them. No, that's us. And yet God is faithful, isn't he? He puts up with so much. And then he calls us to himself over and over again so that we can discover this thing called rest. Because the children of Israel, the Hebrews, wanted to identify with some other solution. And whenever we identify with some other solution, we live in anxiety because the solution isn't Jesus. And anxiety just wreaks havoc in our lives. And it never delivers, so it makes our heart hard. And if I, I watch my son as you've watched your children, unfortunately the world takes some of that tenderness away. You, you love, I love being around little kids. They are so wide-eyed and so filled with awe. Is it any wonder that Jesus just loved on them? I pray for us that we would let our hearts be tenderized through the wilderness. And as our hearts are tenderized, we see Jesus. And with tender hearts, we would be pliable. And in that pliability, we would be transformed. And in that transformation, we would so encourage one another, love one another, that Jesus would just manifest himself through Grace Community Church. And then you know what? Jesus is attractive. Contrary to some of you fundamentalists, Jesus is attractive. People followed him. They saw him and they said, I want to get close to him. And maybe it's a new journey. But if he leads the way, people will want to get close to that. You know, I, I, as you know, I live in Portland. I see God doing all kinds of stuff there in terms of serve the city and social justice and, you know, young people. And it's crazy how people are coming to Christ and churches are growing. Why not here? Same Jesus. We just got to get our eyes. And I'm not saying that you don't. I'm just saying that you're in this transitional wilderness journey, maybe a little bit more difficult at other times, but 
It's, it's not Moses. It's not Joshua. It's not. It's Jesus. And my prayer for you and for me is that we would have tender hearts so that we with wide eyes would say, Jesus, God, I don't, I'm not sure what you're doing, but shape me, make me, mold me into what you want from me, and I'll serve you with all my heart. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you, and our prayer is, we want to see Jesus. Encourage us today. May your Holy Spirit today, may God's people today encourage one another. You have given us so much to learn from in this book called the Bible. And while we read about children of Israel and Hebrew believers, their story is not different than our story. For until we see you face to face, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. We see through a glass darkly. We don't know the future. We only know you who holds the future. And we can trust you because we know what you've done in the past. You saved us. You forgave us. You loved us. My prayer is we'd see Jesus. Would you do that, God? Would you make yourself known to us as we create an environment of love for you to dwell and then do great and wonderful things? If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, he loves you. At an infinite cost to God the Father, he accepts you. It is not about religion, you doing a good thing so God will accept you. It's that God at an infinite cost to his son accepts you so you can live and do a good thing. And my prayer is that you'd allow your heart to be tender. And with wide eyes you'd see Jesus reaching out so that he could love on you in a real way way. He is our captain. He is our king. He is our brother. He is our friend. He is our savior and Messiah. God, thank you for giving us meaning and purpose and life and rest in your son. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Amen.